11. Second Samuel chapter 11, put a finger on Psalm 51. And I promise by the time we're through, this will make a lot more sense than the way I'm sounding right now. Uh, but um, one of the things that, the, well, I shouldn't say one of the things, the only thing Jesus ever refocused in what we call the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer, whichever one you want to look at, Matthew 6, Luke 11, he didn't go back to address the idea of praise. He didn't go back and ask the, uh, to go to the idea of supplication, that is asking for things. He didn't go back to the idea of thanksgiving. He went to one subject that we find still frustrating today, and that is if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father in heaven will forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. And he tells an illustration in Matthew chapter 18. Peter thought he was doing the greatest thing in the world because the rabbis taught in Peter's day and James and John and the other nine apostles that if you forgave somebody three times, the school of Hallel said you had to only forgive somebody three times. Well, he thought he was doing a great thing. He said, let's double it, and then in the same light as what was happening in Peter and James's John's day, they were afraid they'd miscount beatings, for example, or, or stonings or, or stuff like that. And so he added one more just to kind of cushion this. And so he said, if my brother sins against me seven times in a day, how often shall I forgive him? Seventy time or jesus said or seven times jesus said i tell you no not 70 seven times but 70 times seven and and i i tell people this to reinforce this i have a commentaries in my office i don't even hardly look at anymore at, on this subject and the reason is is because they argue whether it's 70 or 490 times or 77 times. That isn't what Jesus said at all. And he tells a story about a man, about a king, who is a creditor. And there's a man who owes him a lot. In fact, when we were doing our puppet show back at home, and if I did my figures right, it's pretty close, $35 million dollars. And he asked the creditor, he asked the king to give him time to pay. He's moved with compassion and he forgives the man all that debt. But when he forgives the man all that debt, he, find, he goes out and he finds somebody that owes him very little. Maybe a dollar by our standards. Maybe $15 by our standards. But comparing the two, he doesn't owe very much. And so he asked the man who's forgiven of the $35 million debt for time to pay. And he doesn't, not only will he not give him time to pay, he takes him by the throat and tells him, you pay me what you owe me. And he throws him into prison. Now, apparently this creditor, uh, this king, is very very good he's very popular with his people i know it's a i know it's a, a fictitious guy in the story that is a parable is a an a earthly story with a heavenly meaning i finally got it right said the five-year-old boy and what he what he does is is that when the two servants see what this man has done they go and they tell the master they tell the king and the master brings him in and said, didn't you understand? I forgave you of much. This man owed you very little and you threw him into prison. 
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to throw you, your wife, and your children into prison, which was legal to do till the debt is paid. Now that would have been fine. That would have been suffice. We'd have liked that story, except we don't like verse 35. So my heavenly father will do to each of you if each of you from his heart does not forgive one another's trespass. That frustrates us. And the reason is, is because Satan has influenced us. We've had it reinforced by, by different people that, look, when you've been wrong, don't ever forgive. Uh, Millie Vanilli, the fake group, said we blame it on the rain, blame it on everything, but don't, ever, whatever you do, don't put the blame on you. I've had people that I automatically know that I did something wrong. And one lady, she got on like, why do you always assume it's you? Because 99% of the time it is. <laughs> That's what I told her. And come to find out, guess who was at fault? Me. Didn't realize it. Had it pointed out. I apologized about it. Now, here's the kicker. Since we've been reinforced with this concept, we don't owe anybody forgiveness. We have this struggle that when somebody does us wrong, when somebody does something to us, that we are never, ever to forgive. But we sure like it when we're forgiven, don't we? We like that idea. Oh, my goodness. We, James put it another way in James 3.12. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. Or in another way to put it, verse 13, where is this wisdom coming from? I mean, with the, with the, with the same mouth, we bless God and curse men who've been made in the likeness of God. And we assume that we're the judge. And, Jay, and he says in chapter 4, there's only one judge. We assume we're the lawgiver. That's, that's, there's only one lawgiver. And by, besides all that in, in the Christian life, wouldn't we just love it if that's all we had to do is observe laws? Man, we'd have, that, we'd have Christianity down to a science. Our problem is we don't serve law Oh, yes, there are, there's the perfect law of liberty. That's not what I said. But we don't have a checklist. You see, we live under grace. And contrary to popular belief, grace is harder to live under than law is. Because, you see, you can argue law. But, you see, grace applies to everybody. Forgiveness applies to everybody. Now, what am I getting at? Well, let's pray first, and then we'll get into Psalm 51. Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We pray that we use the time wisely. And Father, we thank you for all who are here, and we, we pray for those who aren't here. We pray for those who chose not to be here, and we pray that they can be back with us soon. And Father, for those that are dealing with the COVID situation, we pray for them. For those that are dealing with, with chronic issues, we pray for them, like uh, Debbie and Las Cruces and and now they've, they've got their daughter-in-law that's had a, a stroke. And, and it just, Father, it just seems to multiply and snowball on us. But and, and what Satan tries to do is use that to say, you're not in control. You're not in charge of anything. We know better. You chose to send your only begotten son into the world full of grace and truth. And one chaotic Friday, uh, for six hours, your son suffered for our sins. He became our substitute, and we thank you, Father, for him. Thank you you didn't leave him there in the tomb, that he's raised the third day. We just pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now, when we, need, when we go back to Psalm 51, uh, okay, let me see if I can't fix this. Give me just one second. I apologize.
apologize to all of you. All right, let's see if I can get that. All right. You need to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11 to understand this passage. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, there is a king by the name of David. He's the one that wrote this song. He's got such a well-oiled army, that is, they are so well-trained that David and Joab just kind of read each other's mind they don't have any issues that need to be addressed. It's the springtime of the year when kings go out to make war and to acquire territory. And because David has such a great commander by the name of Joab, he decides that he's not going to go and fight in battle on one occasion at least that we know of. Late in the evening, he goes to his rooftop and he sees a drop-dead gorgeous woman by the name of Bathsheba and she's taking a bath. Now, he should have turned away then. But he can't take his eyes off her. Then he inquires who she is. Well, she is Uriah, the Hittite's wife. That's the second warning. And he should have said no. But he brings her to the house. They have an affair. And they lived happily ever after. Not. She sends word to David that she is pregnant. And this is before the days of DNA. This is before the days of anybody knowing anything. This is before the days of gossip. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is social media and, and you know undisclosed sources. Nobody knows this except David and Bathsheba. So what does he do? David brings back Uriah the Hittite from battle. And so he picks a great big feast and what, he, what Uriah wants to do is go back and fight. He's very loyal to the Israelis, very loyal to David. He wants to go back and fight because he feels guilty being home because his fellow soldiers are on the battlefield. And so David thinks what he's going to do is he's going to take Bathsheba home, or uh, Uriah's going to go home, have intimate relations, but when when he, he says, I, I just couldn't do that. So I spent the night in the king's palace, the, the courtyard area. David says, this is not working. And so David brings him back the next day and has another big feast and gets him drunk. Almost on the verge of passing out, which he eventually does. Because when David sends him home, he just knows that he's going to go home, have relations with his wife. And the problem is Uriah passes out and spends the night in the courtyard. He just, he just does. So David does the unthinkable. I've, I've done a personal case study of this. This is the part of the story I just don't get. What he does is, is he sends Uriah back to battle, because that's where Uriah wants to go anyway. He sends by private messenger, somebody he can trust, to tell Joab, put Uriah in the front of the battle, in the fierceness of the battle, and when it gets fierce, retreat. Joab does what he's told. When he has done what he is told, Uriah dies. They send word back to Bathsheba. Bathsheba completes her days of mourning. And she moves into the king's palace. There is no national inquirer. I know that's a little age for my kids. There is no star magazine. There is no 
no tabloid, there's no social media, there's nothing to say this was wrong. Hang on. Because one of my favorite verses is 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven, 27, and we call it a little b. Because the way it's written, it would be like a Disney World st story. And they lived happily ever after. Now, it's not going to say that. But that 1127 says, but the thing David did displeased the Lord. And the very next verse, his best friend, you could call him his best friend, Nathan, the prophet. I mean, he, he's so close to Nathan, comes to him and tells him this story. The story he tells is that there's one man who's got this little female lamb. He, uh, it's like a family member to him. It eats, she eats from the table, sleeps at his side, and there's another man who's got a lot of sheep. When he's got a lot of sheep, he, uh, he and the other fellow exist, but a friend of the one who had a lot of sheep came, and instead of taking one of his own sheep, he took that one man's lamb, killed it, and they had it for supper, or they had it for a meal. Well, the law says you're supposed to reform, restore fourfold. But David goes one step further. He's king. He's got to establish himself. And he says, the man who did this will also die. He's not prepared for the next four words, is he? If you've ever read the story, you are the man. Now, when he says you are the man, we know from Acts 13, 21, that David's a man after God's own heart. The reason is, is because when he, when his sin is pointing out, he doesn't say what he says because he got caught. He really means that he sinned against the Lord. Nathan said, your sin has been forgiven you, but because you had opportunity to reproach the, the Lord, the child born to you will die. And so Bathsheba has the baby. It is a boy. And David is fasting, and he is praying, and he's doing everything he can change the Lord's mind. In fact, they ask him why he's not getting up to eating. He says, look, maybe the Lord will change his mind. Maybe I'll have this son. And so he can see his servants come in and they have a different disposition. He knows the child is dead. And so he gets up, cleans himself up, and he orders food be brought. Well, now they really think that he's in the denial stage. He's, he's just crazy. And they ask him, why did you, why are you now getting up and resuming duties? And I like to use this at funerals, but I, li I like to use it at other times too. And that is, what you don't understand is, is that the child will not return to me, but I'll go to the child. I'm going to where the child is. And what kind of reunion that's going to be, I look forward to seeing. It is in that context that Psalm 51 is written. And what he asked for is God's mercy. Now, here's our problem with this. By the way, let's read verse 1 and 2. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now, here's, here's what we have a problem with. We are real good at classifying sins. Oh, my goodness gracious. What David did would have made every headline newspaper, social media, 
we'd had people coming out of the woodwork saying that he ought to have been killed or, excuse me, assassinated or, or withdrawn from office. I mean, oh my goodness gracious. Well, you, you can't blame me for, for lying, can you, James? Lying's not a bad sin. Come on, Jackie, lying's not a bad sin, is it? I mean, cussing's not a bad sin, is it? I had a guy put on Facebook today that this is intolerable. Take the Lord's name in vain. Well, guess who I've heard take the Lord's name in vain? That's what I wanted to write back to him, but I didn't. And we were real good at this classifying sin business. We say, oh, you know, lying's a good sin. I can't even say it with a straight face. And murder's a bad sin. Here's, here's the problem with that. Sin is sin. And as Ken Stegall says, the, pro, the, the righteousness of God will not tolerate sin. And the righteousness of God always outranks the love of God. And we, we don't like that. Because we like to talk about the love of God. We just don't like to talk about the hate of God. How dare you say God hates? Well, look what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what he did at the Tower of Babel. Look what he did to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. I said one time, preaching on Acts 5, and I said, God killed them. And a lady says, God didn't kill them. I said, where did you get that? Well, they just died. <laughs> no, God killed them. Peter said the very God, the very Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that your husband lied to is the same one you're lying to. And when she heard that, she dropped dead. She dropped dead. And so we have another issue with this business of forgiveness, and that is Forgiveness, everybody here except me can be forgiven. And the reason is because my sin's a lot worse than yours, Karen. Uh, my sin's a lot worse than yours, Adele. You know, and, and God, you deserve the forgiveness of God. That is, when you ask God and he, oh, God will come through, but he won't come through for me. Well, I know he died for all of us, but I mean, come on. My sin's worse than your sin. No, you're right. He died for all of us. And so sometimes what is so hard for us is to accept this forgiveness too. Um, and you're, you're serious. You're telling me that to get the forgiveness of God is easy. Yes. How do I know that? Well, go to go to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. And I have Christian people that tell me this is a lie. <laughs> because it's so simple. It is so easy. If we confess our sins, he is, number one, faithful. And he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You, you're, you're kidding me, right? All I got to do is confess my sins and, and he's going to forgive? Yeah. Yeah, the, the problem is we, we rehash sin, as Bree's pointing out. We rehash sin and, and, and we just, we remember it. And one of my favorite statements, we're upstairs in the old 12th and West building, and uh, this, this gal was having this issue of, of the forgiveness of God. And Willard Tate was sitting there, and he said, have you ever asked God for forgiveness? She said, you don't know how many times. He said, honey, the first time you asked for forgiveness, that's all God needed to hear. He said, because when you bring it up, God's going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. That is so strange, is it not? A perfect God with imperfect people, but where did the hand holding get occur? At the cross. 
He didn't leave him there. No, but at the cross. And so you're telling me that this simple acknowledgement for sin is what God wants to hear? For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sin and those are, and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He makes the confession. Now, what I find intriguing about this is, is there anything that God doesn't know? And we turn around and we'll say, well, no, God really isn't interested in forgiveness because, you know, and, and we act like God didn't know what we did. We, we act like God didn't know what anything. Well, we, we know better. And so what does he do? He, he confesses his sin and the damage sin can do. I can't remember all the points, but I think it's Max Licato who pointed out sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. Sin will keep you longer than you're willing to stay. And those two things are true. He says, I, I, I just, this just has gone against my bones. Verse, verse uh, five, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, in the hidden part you'll make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. That's the only one that can do it. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. It hit me a long time ago, and I think the Holy Spirit had a lot to do with it. How can I forgive somebody? How can I accept this forgiveness? Realize, folks, there is nothing, and I want to emphasize this word, nothing. Nothing people have done to you that's been worse than what you did to the Lord. And that includes me, by the way. Now, what did he choose to do? I think this ties in with Bree's point. Look, I was guilty. The strangest passage to us is Romans chapter 3. When Paul says, how many people do are good? How many people are good? Nobody. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But what did he say? We've been made justified. That word justified means when it comes into God's court, he finds us not guilty. How does that work? Through Jesus. And so he praises, gives God praise. Look at verse 14. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, these, O oh God, you will not despise. It is not acceptable to God. God will not tolerate. God will not put up with the following. You know, all my sins I did last week, if I just go to church, God will just absolve them. That goes back to keeping a law. You see, I, I went and I checked off what I was, so God just will absolve me of all of those sins if I go to church. That's not what he says. Look, if we want to, if God just wanted a sacrifice, that's fine. Remember what he what Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel 22, 15, 22? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Tying in with this statement. And so what does he want? He wants God to restore him. Verse 9, verse 18. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. 
Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they'll offer bulls on your altar. He makes this simple confession. Now go to Psalm 32. Here's why this is so important. There is, a, There are a lot of what I call epitaphs, that is understatements, in world history. And this is one of them. The very first statement, blessed. I like the amplified version on this. To be envied, prosperous. Now, we always translate it to be happy, and that's true. But when he says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I mean, let's go back to what we said a minute ago, Romans chapter 3. How many do good? Nobody. There's none who does good. No, not one. There's none good. There's going to be a lot more bad people in heaven than there are good people in heaven, because there is no good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we've been made justified. So when he says this fact of forgiveness, it ties in so well with the agony of sin. Look at verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones grew old. Through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledge my sin toward you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you will forgive the iniquity of my sin, right? No, for you forgave the iniquity of of my sin. Now, hang on just a second. How does that work? The same way it works today. There's only one person through whom forgiveness comes. Now, when people tell me they want to go back and observe the old law, I tell them, you just want a reminder of sins every year. Wouldn't you just love it if you came to the Bible study tonight, wouldn't you love it if you came to church this morning or Sunday morning and said, you know what, you're a sinner and you just left the sinner the same way. That's all you are. Oh, uh, no, you wouldn't like that. You wouldn't like that at all. You'd give up. So what does David say? Verse six. For this cause, everyone who is godly will pray to you in a time when you may be found Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You're my, you're my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. And we know of two times that that at least happened, 1 Samuel 24 through 27, when King Saul tried to kill him. He had the opportunity to, I mean, he cut off his robe the first time. And he said, why are you after me? And Saul said, well, I... I, I sinned and I shouldn't have done that. Then he goes after him again because he wants to he wants to kill David because David, Jonathan's supposed to be, his son's supposed to be the new king. But even Jonathan knows who's going to be the king of Israel. And so David makes sure that he's doing what's right. So he gives this oracle, that is this lesson. In verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you, not God, I will instruct his people in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Listen to what God says. We have a big problem with listening. We hear a lot of things, but we have a big problem with listening. See, you shouldn't, I shouldn't listen to you, you should listen to me. Or as one guy said one night, uh, told a young lady, now we're going to have this discussion and I'm going to do the talking and we're going to get this settled. That didn't work then, it's not going to work today. And I don't know why he thought he could do that. Now, verse 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, 
But he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and then rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright of heart. Now, go to Psalm 103. And we like David's point in Psalm 103. When you go to Walmart or you go to the dollar store, as is our custom, you like the fact that when you go to the store, you find not only what you need, but sometimes you find what you want. A friend of mine said the other day that that they went to Sam's and Crucis and couldn't find any bacon. That's a pretty big store not to be able to find bacon. They found plenty of ham, but they couldn't find any bacon. And he wanted bacon. I haven't found anything yet that bacon's bad for, but... <laughs> uh, but you want the supply of bacon to be there. Well, watch what he says in Psalm 103. Very first thing, bless the Lord... O oh, my soul, all that is in me, bless his name, his holy name, excuse me. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, or who forgives all your iniquities. Now, wait just a minute. Uh, he didn't forgive all of them, does he? That's what he just said. Now, it's, it's one thing to forgive one thing. You're telling me he forgives all of them? Yes. Who heals all your diseases? Now, wait just a minute. I, I have a disease I haven't been healed of yet. I have a chronic issue. He's not talking about physically. He's talking about spiritually. There are a lot of sick people walking around spiritually. And yet, what did Jesus say over in Luke 4? Verse 23, you're going to say to me, physician, Heal yourself. That's why Jesus would say what he would say. I didn't call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Who redeems your life from destruction. That's a buyback policy. There's an old little Old Testament book. It's a minor prophet book by the name of Hosea. The proper way to say it is Hosea, but traditionally we've said Hosea, and I'll leave it that way. He marries a prostitute by the name of Gomer. No relation to Gomer Pyle, pun intended. And when he marries her, she goes out to her lovers and she becomes pregnant. She brings home children that are not Hosea's. When you get to chapter four of that book, she is sold, getting ready to be sold on the auction block again, which is legal. And God tells Hosea, you go take everything you've got and buy her back. And the application is, Hosea is symbolized, or excuse me, God is symbolized by Hosea. Gomer is symbolized by Israel. Israel. They went off after their lovers, brought home illegitimate children, and then God bought them back. Well, we did the same thing. We did our own thing. We did what we wanted to do. And yet, what has God done? It's cost him everything he's got or he had. Cost him his son. And yet he proudly has many, many children. Forgive me, I can't remember the name of the, of the uh, psalm, but it's as happy as the man who has many children. They are quivers to him. Wow. Are you crazy? You don't want more than two kids in this day and age. You don't want more than three kids. In, I mean, you can go on and on with worldly wisdom. But watch what he says in verse four. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfy your mouth or satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. There's one example that this, this fits. I know it fits consistently. But when the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, what happened to their clothes? Did they wear out? No. 
What happened to their shoes? They didn't wear out either. They died in the wilderness. I just replaced a pair of shoes I had, and I think I've had them for three years, thanks to Bree. My shoes, and the only reason I bought them was because they're very comfortable, but they're starting to let things through the, the bottom of the, <laughs> the sole of the foot. And so here you, you have David saying, look, he surrounds us with all these great things. Then he says to be, that he praises God for his, for his mercies. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Do you remember Jonah? Jonah chapter 4 is especially. He is angry with God. No, 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 no. That's not really the right word. He is livid with God. You see, he hates the Ninevites. He probably shouldn't have, but the Ninevites were a cruel people. When they enslaved you, the first thing they did was they took hooks and they run it right through the septum of the nose. And they drag you off. They'd be cruel and oppressive. They'd be just as cruel as, as when uh, in, in the book of Judges in chapter 6 when the Midianites came in and the Israelites literally were hiding in caves. That's, that's exactly the way. I mean, the Midianites had nothing on the Assyrians. The Babylonians inherited it and they accentuated it. And the most hated people in the world were the Assyrians. And so what does God do? God says, you go to the capital, Nineveh. You tell that great city, at 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. So what does Jonah do? He gets in a boat and goes the other way. And all of a sudden, the sea gets, starts getting tempestuous. Jonah knows what it's about. The other, other guys don't. And he says, throw me overboard and it'll stop. Well, they threw everything else overboard. Finally, they didn't have anything else to throw overboard, so they threw Jonah in the sea. And, and I still think part of me says that this great fish that God created in Jonah, when they're not going to do what they're supposed to do, he's waiting for the fireworks. He's waiting for the fireworks to just go everywhere when god doesn't do that jonah is livid i mean he is livid with god he tells god oh i know you're a god who is what was that phrase again slow merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in mercy. And so God takes him through a lesson. He creates this big, what we would call basically a gourd vine that grows up and it, and it has this huge umbrella. Jonah appreciates the gourd vine. You know what Jonah appreciated that he didn't, that he didn't realize? He appreciated the grace of God. And God causes a worm to eat that gourd vine or that big umbrella vine, whatever it is. And then Jonah said, God says, do you have a right to be angry? Jonah says, I've got a right to be angry even to the point of death. Not, not once, but twice. Now, here's what Jonah wanted to do. And this is what I fear Christians would like to see today. And that is 120,000 people in Nineveh, plus much livestock, were going to die. And Jonah was approving of it. Now, by the way, one of those sidebar notes that I always want to know is why is it that we don't know what happened to Jonah? Holy Spirit says it's not important, but I often wonder what happened to Jonah? Because 
what Jonah needed to realize is we need to praise God for his glory and his tender care. Look at verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are Superman, right? We are dust. Well, if he remembers we're dust, and he knows we're dust, then it stands to reason he better, he, he's very merciful to us. And we need to be merciful to people around us. Now, that doesn't always work with us because what he does compare here is the temporariness of humanity. Peter does that same thing in 1 Peter 1, verse 22. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. To such as keep his covenant. And to those who remember his commandments to do them. If there's one thing... Moses kept emphasizing to the children of Israel, it was do what God told you to do. Proverbs, or excuse me, Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, choose. Choose life by obeying, choose death by disobeying. Joshua said it another way, choose this day for yourselves whom you'll serve, whether the gods on the, on the other side of the river or the gods in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, Joshua 24, 15. And for some reason, our stubborn hearts don't get that message. I've told somebody this before, but bear with those who had not heard it. I'm sitting here one day and I couldn't figure out what was going on. We had a, we had quite a crowd that morning. It was great. And all of a sudden, this Christian man was so furious that this other Christian brother was at church. They're both members of the church. And he says, I cannot believe you let that man in the building. And I said, who? And he told me. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know what that man did to my family? You know what And he went on and on. And I said, brother, do you realize how you're jeopardizing your soul? And he looked and he shook his head. And I said, look, I don't know what's going on here, but I know this. If you don't forgive men their trespasses, God's not going to forgive you. And you know what he said? I don't believe that. And he's still upset with me about something. I've never figured out what he's upset with me about. Now, the point I'm making is not that I'm better, but look at this temporary humanity of life of the everlasting rule of God. And then he turns, and, and this is so true today, Verse 20, bless the Lord, or verse 19, I'm sorry. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, oh my God. So, now, one of the ways that I tell people frequently, when they ask me, why do you believe there's a God? Why don't you believe there's a God? Well, I haven't seen him. Really? No, I've never seen God. I've never seen God either. But I sure have seen plenty of works of God. One guy told, told us early this morning, 
He said, there is hardly any more beautiful place than New Mexico. I kind of snickered to myself, not to be disrespectful, but I kind of snickered to myself because my school kids say, this is the ugliest place to ever live. <laughs> but just tonight, if you can get away from the city lights, just look up. I would love to be in one of those Teslas. Even if it was for one hour, I've told people I want to go up to, to the moon and I want to lay on the moon for one hour. I want to find one of those rocks and kick back and just lay back there and just look around. The moon is 238,000 miles from here. And do you realize if it moves the wrong way, it affects the tidal waves in our country, in our world? Brother Harab reminded us that if the earth is one sixth closer to the sun, we'll all burn up. If it moves one sixth away, and I know people in Texas and Oklahoma and most of the country would argue with us, we'll all freeze to death. God knew what he was doing. I'm fascinated with this Mars Endeavor thing, or uh, not Endeavor, uh, I'll think of it later, but, uh, but it's just amazing, God's creation. The Voyager is still going. They have never got, they said the last that, that uh, I heard, which was I think six months ago, if they send some message to Voyager, it takes two weeks to get to it. Light travels at 186,000 feet per second. That's the speed of light. And it takes two weeks to get a message to Voyager. It takes two weeks for it to come back. I liked what one individual said. If you think you're important, and I encourage you to go to YouTube sometimes, watch this video and all of a sudden, this big, huge expanse of the universe. And there's a little bit of Earth about like this. <laughs> and yet, what do we know? Has God forgotten us? No. Is God with us? Yes. Is God for us? Yes. You mean little old me? Yeah, little old you. And what he's interested in is forgiveness, not punishment. Will he punish? Yes. But what is he interested in? He's interested in forgiveness, folks. That's what he wants. He wants all people to repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. Anybody want to add anything to that tonight? I thank you for being here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time. We, we pray that we've used it wisely. And we just thank you, Father, for the means of communications that we have like Zoom and and Facebook and, and all those things that we sometimes get aggravated with, Father. We, we thank you that we have YouTube and other ways to communicate and, and deal with each other. And Father, we'd like to be together more often and we pray this COVID mess will go away and that more people can get vaccinated, more people can do what needs they need to do and that they will be well. Father, we pray for spiritually people that are so sick. Father, we, we know there's only one cure for it, and that's the great physician. Help us to show them by our example. Help us to show them by the use of the word of what the Bible means to them and what the Bible teaches and what we know is that you want and you've spent everything you had for everybody to go to heaven, but we know most people aren't. And Father, we don't do always what you want. As, as Paul said, there's none good. But by the grace of God, we are what we are, and we pray you'll forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. And I thank you all for being here.